Welcome to the Tea with Buda. Today we have the honor of having Jennifer McClellan joining us. Senator McClellan has been uh, an advocate for Virginians for over 15 years officially and the entirety of her life unofficially. On our show, we have our repeat uh, presenters and as far as our guests and our host and uh, tech guru. Our host, co-host today is Krista Jones and Nick Gothard is our tech guru. So we welcome everybody and thank you for joining us. Welcome Jennifer McClellan, how are you today? I am well, thank you Buda for having me and Krista and Nick, good to see you guys. Well, it is our absolute pleasure. So before we started recording, Nick and uh, Krista and I were talking about how we actually met Nick. And I'm gonna let Krista tell a story as to how that came in because it'll now connect to you yourself. So go ahead, Krista. Well, it was at a fundraiser that um, you kind of hosted, co-hosted for Buda and Le Leesburg. I don't remember, it was last fall, or no, 2019, the fall of 2019 in downtown Leesburg. And Nick was there. And he, that was the first time that he met you and the first time that he met both of us. So he reminded us of that. <laughs> so he was saying, now we're all connected again. <laughs> oh, it's like we put the band back together. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. So we wanted to thank you for, for one, having uh, done that, but two, for having uh, given us the opportunity to meet Nick. Because now look where we are. The band is together and that, that puts it uh, all into place. But thank you again uh, for always having supported us. And we want to now just to be able to have a conversation because you've had a very busy, are we at 45 or 44 days? I've lost count. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if we had two Thursdays and we skipped Friday uh, on the legislative calendar, which is a whole thing. But uh, so I don't know what day it is. <laughs> That, fair enough, but this is now your regular full uh, legislative session. And can you just give us some ideas as far as from the perspective of criminal justice reform, what topics have you been involved in and what successes have we had thus far? So the one that I'm probably the most proud of um, is dealing with the intersection of mental health, uh, autism, and uh, intellectual developmental disabilities in the criminal justice system. Right now, short of pleading not guilty by reason of insanity, there's just no way to present evidence of any of those conditions. Um, um, and so we are passing a bill that allows you to present evidence of those conditions if it's relevant to whether or not you had the required intent for a crime. It requires additional training for court-appointed attorneys um, and judges. And it also allows the judge to consider those conditions for bail and sentencing. So it is, it, I didn't realize quite how big a deal this bill was until, you know, as we were getting into the session, that this is really going to be transformative uh, legislation. So that's, that's the one I'm probably the proudest of. And that's awesome. Now we're going to go a little bit into your background because you graduated from UVA Law, did you not? I did, yes. That is pretty awesome. Well, we don't have to get into numbers, but that's good to know. <laughs> Cause I, cause I, every time somebody talks age, I was like, all right, we're good. <laughs> uh, but having attended UVA Law at that time when you were in law school, did you, did you have your path already set for yourself that you were going to get into um, the politics and, and working as an advocate from the community from that angle versus to just being a lawyer? I did, but it, I didn't get there the way I expected to. So when when I went to law school, my dream job was to be counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee um, or really any congressional committee. But that was my dream job. Um, and when I got, you know, while I was in law school, Republicans took over Congress and I was like, I don't want to work for them. So I ended up going the law firm route, ironically. But um, I was very active already in the in the Young Democrats um, and was president of the state Young Democrats my entire time in law school. So while my friends in their free time were playing softball or um, doing, you know, whatever you do when you have a little bit of free time in law school, I was doing campaign invasions and uh, and knocking on doors all over Virginia. Now, that is very cool because you're right. You could have at least you know, been working on the beer bong or some other skill set. But I'm glad you went this route instead, because that's actually very cool where it got you. Um, now, once you started as far as within law school and uh, going into the, as you said, the uh, private sector and working the firms, 
how did you then reset yourself and get back into working with the General Assembly? So let me let me take you back a little bit. Um, I I came to decide I decided really young when I was eleven that I wanted to be part of government somehow, um, and I really learned that because I'm a huge history nerd. My parents grew up during the Depression in the segregated South. Um, and then I saw a movie about John F. Kennedy. And, and so when I was in college, um, I, I got involved with the Young Democrats then and started doing um, student organizing. But I also got an internship at every level of government to figure out what I liked. So um, I worked in Governor Wilder's policy office. I worked in Senator Chuck Robb's district office. I even did a stint in the mayor's office of contracts up in New York um, for Mayor Dinkins. And I and I decided that state state law, our state government was really my sweet spot. Most of the issues I really cared about. I loved the legislative process, um, but which is what made me want to go work in Congress. Um, and I continued volunteering every single year on elections. Um, to be honest, when, when I graduated in 1997, and you may remember um, that was the second statewide um, elections we lost in a row, I got a little burned out and decided to take a step back. And I ended up um, in Texas for work. And, and when I came back, I got involved with the Sorensen Institute because uh, one of the partners that I worked with at, at Hunt and Williams was on the board. And that reminded me why I got interested in government to begin with um, and sort of reignited that spark of, I really want to be involved in making a change. Um, and so, but I still thought it was going to be mainly electing other people. I didn't decide to run until my delegate, Viola Basco, ran for lieutenant governor. And friends started coming to me saying, you should run for her seat. You should. And the more I thought about it, I was like, you know what? I really do want to be the one making the change, not just electing somebody else to do it. So um, I was 32 and single and, uh, and ran and won and, and, and never looked back. That is awesome. So now I'm going to go back to what you were saying earlier about the, the intersectionality between mental health and the criminal justice system. You being in government for the almost 15 years that you have been from it again, from an official perspective, uh, I'm sure that you saw a lot of mental health bills or coming across the, your desk or you being asked to, to remark upon. Prior to this, and I'll call it within the last couple of years, because I think that's when uh, the focus point has been. How did this become then something that you wanted to, to take the lead in and be a champion for? So it started, it started with Virginia Tech, with the shooting at Virginia Tech, um, which was my second year in um, the General Assembly. I was, and I was on the education committee at the time. Um, and, um, if, and I don't think I was on the courts committee, but was very interested in being on the courts committee. So Part of the study that happened after Virginia Tech, you know, we on the education committee were really looking at um, how to implement changes in higher ed to prevent a similar tragedy. Um, while the courts committee was looking at on the criminal justice side, how do we deal we deal with it? Um, and we we made some progress and the biggest progress we made was investing in community-based care. Mm -hmm. um, and then Senator Deeds' tragedy happened. Um, and, and there was another study and there was another rash of um, legislation um, dealing with the TDO process and what happens if you can't find a, a, a bed. and. I started thinking, um, and now you're going to see how big a nerd I am. Uh, I had to do a, a public policy journal article, and they told me, they said, you can do it on whatever you want. And I said, I, you know, I'm really interested in the public policy of addressing mental health. And the more I studied it, I, I found out, you know, Virginia, Eastern State in Virginia was the first public mental health institution in the Western hemisphere. 
So Virginia really led the way. Now, granted, the services provided were horrible by today's standards, but we really led the way in mental health as a public service. That was after a tragedy and a study in legislation, and then decades of nothing happened. Tragedy, study, legislation, decades of nothing happened. And I, and I recognized that cycle and said, we have got to stay on top of this issue. So while that was happening, you know, I was getting a lot of calls from constituents who either had, had kids in schools who were being um, suspended or long-term, um, long-term suspended, expelled, referred to law enforcement for behavior that really was the beginning of autism or ADHD or something like that. Um, or who had been caught up, you know, arrested for a crime that they just, you know, didn't have any idea they were committing. And that's what prompted me to file last year a bill requesting the Supreme Court and the Secretary of Public Safety to develop policies to deal with, you know, how are we going to accommodate people with, with mental health conditions? That didn't go anywhere. So at UVA, a friend of mine, Andy Block, started a public policy law clinic. And he said, hey, is there an issue that you want my students to research and help you with? And I said, yeah, as a matter of fact, there is. And so they dug into this issue and, and working with them and, and Professor Richard Bonney, um, we, we came up with this bill. And um, you know, the more we dug into it, we were like, this is a huge issue, not just in Virginia, but across the country. And, and we are really going to make um, some significant change with this bill. And that's awesome, because I can tell you that in my 27 years as a defense attorney, because we get a chance to get to know our clients, there was many times an opportunity for me to learn that, as you indicated earlier, the actions of the person may have been criminal, but the intent and, you know, not to get all lawyer terminology and all that, but the mens rea was not there. And you couldn't introduce that to a judge. You couldn't, it would be admissible, and you couldn't introduce that to a jury. And they're left with just the resulting action. And it just, in my mind's eye at that point in time, said, we're not really giving them all the information that they need to make the right decision. Exactly. Um, and, and this passage or this hopeful passage uh, of this um, statute would be very helpful because, again, it allows for the judge and the jury to consider it. They can then decide how they're going to decide, but at least they have more information. And that's always the better result of a decision is when you are more informed. Um, exactly. So I, I really very much appreciate that. Now, some of the other things that you and your partners out in the uh, General Assembly also dealt with was trying to see what we could do to reduce voter suppression, you know, to make it yeah. much more able that people can vote how they want to vote and when they uh, can vote, obviously, within the terms uh, provided. But uh, give us a little bit of information as to, for you, what was so important, because especially what we saw last year and then with the January 6th events, uh, the, even the, the normal community who may not be politically uh, invested or engaged or, or really interested, boy, did a lot of people start listening and seeing things mm -hmm. that had been going on for a long time and generations even, that now we're like, oh, that's how yeah. the game was played. So yeah. educate us a little bit on, on what you saw from your personal experiences and then what you uh, ended up trying to promote within the General Assembly this session. Yeah, so first of all, you know, in my own family, um, my great-grandfather, my, my dad's um, stepfather, happened to write a book. And in the book, he talks about when he went to register to vote and he had to take a literacy test. And it had all kinds of crazy questions. He got them all right. They made him take more. Then he had to find three white people to vouch for him before he could register to vote. That was in 1901 in Alabama. Um, and uh, uh, on, on January 5th, as I was looking through some of my dad's papers, I found a copy of his receipt for the poll tax he had to pay in 1947. So that's my father. <laughs> like That's not that long ago. Um, and, and we saw after the Voting Rights Act was gutted by the Shelby case, how all of these states, Repub mostly Republican, um, 
started passing laws that that either intentionally or unintentionally made it harder for voters, you know, voters of color in particular to vote. I think that was intentional, but we'll just leave it at that. Um, now, meanwhile, here, um, when we had, when, we, when, when Democrats took control last January, which seems like a hundred years ago, we took the first step by doing no excuse absentee balloting. So 45 days of voting. And then when COVID hit, we wanted to make sure that voting was easier and safer. So in, in the budget, um, you know, we did all the things that everybody, that everybody um, was able to, to, to vote easier, safer, uh, and led to record turnout in November. So this session, we, we wanted to make sure that those, those temporary measures were made permanent. So we did that. But more importantly, we don't know when Congress is going to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act. Um, and we don't know, you know, if Republicans take over the General Assembly again, are we going to see the same kinds of laws that we're seeing introduced all around the country right now? Um, and so working with Delegate Marcia Price and, and Tram Newen at New Virginia Majority um, and a lot of other groups, we developed the Voting Rights Act in Virginia. And now, and that has already passed. I carried the Senate version, Sia carried the House version. Both are on their way to the governor. Now Virginia is the first state in the South to have its own Voting Rights Act. And it will, pro, it will protect Virginia voters from voter suppression voter intimidation um, and, 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 and disenfranchisement on the basis of race. It'll require localities, if they make any changes to their, their voting, um, not, not their, their like polling places or hours or anything like that, they've got to publicize them in advance, give people an opportunity to comment. And, um, and if it's gonna disproportionately impact people of color, you know, make changes. Um, it strengthened our voter intimidation laws. It created a private right of action um, and authorizes the attorney general to file a lawsuit uh, if, if a locality or an area is, is discriminating. And so very proud of that. Very, very proud of that. And especially when I think back to how um, my family had to fight for the right to vote. And not only did I carry that bill, but I am sitting on the very committee that hears voting issues as a member of the state Senate in the former capital of Confederacy. Um, just like, I get chills thinking about that. I was gonna say, what a way to honor your heritage. Yeah. You know, cause uh, we always talk about our generation standing on the shoulders of others. Um, yeah. but you definitely set yourself up so that you are alongside them and you're creating opportunities for other people then to come here after and be able to, to follow that dream, just being able to vote. And we've talked about this, honestly, you vote however you want to vote, but don't stop somebody else from voting. Yes. And, and that, those are some of the travesties that we saw, in, especially last year in a lot of different States where they would close polling stations in, as you said, you, you have to give notice there. They didn't give notice except for our news to be like, well, guess what? This community who had 100 polling stations has six and there's a million people. Yeah. You know, so those are things that always frustrated me because I feel like obviously it is very intentional, but it was so intentional. It wasn't even trying to be coy about it or slick or like, well, I would do it on a download. They're like, yeah, but I don't care if you vote or you don't vote. Here's it is. So I'm going to make it impossible for you to vote. And yeah. that's the hard thing to take about that. Right. It's that they don't even have to be slick. If they don't, you know, so now at least <laughs> that just makes it really difficult to take. But I just want to make a comment. I actually don't have a question right now, but really glad you touched on that point, Buda, about her family um, and what they went through in doing that research. And as I'm listening to you talk, I have spent most of 2020 on 23andMe and Ancestry.com looking up. Oh, yeah. Ancestors. <laughs> and just it just kind of brings you to that time of what they must have had to go through. And that's what makes the work we do today also special. So, you know, I just really wanna thank you as a legislator for the work that you've done because that makes me feel a little bit better that I'm able to live in a world where even though they couldn't see this where we are now, at least it's happening, so. Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. And it's really, and it's, it's, it's funny because, um, you know, I was the oops baby. Um, my, <laughs> my parents, uh, were 40 and 47 when I was born. And, and so to hear my parents tell stories of what it was like in the thirties and the forties, um, and, and hear my grandparents talk about what it was like, um, made it real for me because it, I, I wasn't taught any of that in school. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and, and now, you know, I chair the state's MLK commission and we've become sort of the default agency to commemorate uh, black history. And I've learned things from that. I never learned in school. Like the fact that there were, 22 black men on the constitution in, in the constitutional convention that created the 1868 constitution to allow us back into the union. And that there were over a hundred African-American men who served in the general assembly during reconstruction. I never learned that in school. I never learned about the racial integrity act of 1924 and the horrible impact that it's had. Um, and so it, it, I've always thought, Yes, rate, overt racism obviously is a problem. Everybody recognizes that. But the hidden problem is what I call race ignorance, is the number of people born after Jim Crow who don't learn about it in school, it's not their family experience, and so they don't understand that the impacts of slavery and Jim Crow didn't go away when laws changed, and we still are dealing with the impact today. You know, it's difficult because my dad says, and I know you were talking about all people, not just white people, but my dad says, well, I don't want you to have to at least worry. Not that he didn't want me to learn the history, but he's like, my generation went through it for a reason. And so you all could kind of enjoy the fruits. But there is so much power in knowing that struggle. Yes. Oh, my gosh. I'm so glad you said that. You know, I, I, on a lark. So my, my dad passed away in 2014 and he and his father and his grandfather all had the same name, James F. McClellan. On a lark, I Googled James F. McClellan. And that is how I found out that my grandfather was one of the lawyers for the students in Nashville who did the sit-ins, who included John Lewis. He, <laughs> ne- he never talked about it. You know, my dad had a file. He, my dad never threw anything away. He had a file full of 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 things he did as a member of the NAACP that he never talked about. And when I asked him, he said, well, you know, that generation just didn't talk about it because they were like, you know, we did it so you would have a better life, not to brag about what we did. And it's like, yeah, but I need to know. (laughs) I need to know this stuff. I need to know this stuff. So I have really worked hard both as a legislator, but just as someone who has a public platform to share this history and how it still impacts our present. And that's awesome that you guys do that. And and as you just said, you have to do it because it's not coming from our history books. It's not coming from, you know, the local papers and, you know, literally history is whitewashed. Um, And it's, it's amazing when you learn something, you're like, well, how the hell did I miss that? And it's not that you missed it. It just was never presented. So you didn't have the opportunity to, to face it and say, fine, I'm not interested. I'm going to just disregard it. It just was never served. Exactly. Um, and, and that's the part that, as you and Chris have been mentioning, is we need to know that history. Even if it's not my personal experience, that experience, when I see it in somebody else, may also help me better understand that person. Yep. Because that's what we're lacking is we're lacking that aspect of our relationships because we don't know how that person got here. And, you know, we, we I've said this statement uh, amongst our team a lot of times where I look at the person who they are today and I realize how ignorant I am because I'm not seeing the layers and the, the years and the, the experiences that brought you to who you are. I'm just seeing this finished, polished person. I'm not seeing the bumps, bruises or any of those things. But that's what made that person. Exactly. Um, so sharing that history is something that, that we really owe it to our next generation and even our current generation. When you start talking about as far as Jim Crow laws and uh, slavery and things of that nature that impacted our society, for me, it was a huge eye opener within about the five years as to the impact that had on our criminal justice system. Oh, yeah. 
I've been a lawyer for 27, 28 years. Honestly, I don't know how and why I never made that connection because it's blatant. So it's not like even that is not, it's not there. I just never saw it. And oh, I yeah. realized it for a lot of reasons. One, it's my privilege and it's my perspective. I didn't have that lens. So now seeing it where we see, you know, the way that laws are <clears throat> one created and then how they are uh, enacted and then how they're enforced, it's all intentional. Uh, you have a statement on, on one of your pages and you talk about it and, I'm, and I stole this because I may, I may maybe hopefully remember to credit you. If I don't, I'm giving you my credit now and then just don't sue me later. But you talk okay. about the government is a force for progressive change or it could be a force uh, of oppression that benefits a select few. And that is obviously the law is a reflection of the government. But that's what the law exactly is. Yeah. Depending on who you are, your infraction or your violation could be something that we look at and we're like, you know what? You got promise. We're good. Or, oh my gosh, because you don't fit in that category. Now we got to figure out is how to use the law to its fullest extent to make sure that you are consequenced. Right? Yeah. Just in, and these are things that within the criminal justice system that what uh, you and the General Assembly did this past year to allow us to make some changes as to what we have to do in the courtroom is going to further the betterment of our community. Um, yeah. Allow us to be able to go in court and decide what case is not because a judge thinks that they sh they should be making those decisions on their own. Um, it's a resource thing. We can choose to snatch the low hanging fruit because it gives us numbers, or we could choose to dedicate ourselves to the more significant crimes. And that that uh, passage of those uh, laws has really been able to help us to start looking as to how the laws really are impacting our community. Um, Right now with marijuana, just a simpler topic, last year was decriminalized. Where are we this year with the legalization and what, uh, how will it be uh, enacted and, and uh, actually uh, I'm sorry, carried out? Well, as of when we're recording this, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's another one that's in conference. Um, and we're, we're, we're supposed to adjourn tomorrow. So hopefully they will reach a deal right now. They're in stalemate. Um, I can tell you where there are areas of dis of agreement. Um, that is that legalization and the full sort of regulated retail, wholesale, manufacturer market and regulations won't happen until 2024. Mm -hmm. um, some of us, you know, me being included, really hoped we would, at a minimum, um, end the prohibition of simple possession. July one, um, because even though we have decriminalization, um, we still have disproportionate impact on communities of color. And, and last year I, I carried the study that asked ALARC to look at this and look at how we can legalize in a way that addresses the inequity of prohibition that reinvests in communities that have been damaged by prohibition disproportionately. And not surprisingly, I mean, JLR proved what we already knew that it's it's predominantly people of color that are that are arrested, um, even though their use rate is not higher. Um, and and even with decrim, you are the data since that took in effect, you are four times more likely to get that twenty five dollar fine if you're black or brown. So we were really hoping to at least end that July 1, but we, we, we can't get that done. So right now, um, the sticking point is whether we have a reenactment clause on the criminal penalties, the new criminal penalties and the regulated market to give us more time to make sure we're doing it right. And should we have an advisory referendum? Um, so those are the sticking points. So I'll add one more angle that I haven't heard discussed, uh, but I think it should be on the forefront of that, uh, the reasons why it should be promoted. It is really, it's also a health issue. And I say this because if it's unregulated, then we don't know what, what's in it, right? So people are going to use it anyway. So you're not stopping the use, and I don't think you're going to increase the use by, by legalizing it. But what you're going to end up doing is there's going to be at least some standards that we can mm -hmm. worry about as to how it is going to be consumed. You know, yeah. we think about alcohol back in the prohibition days, right? People were still making it in their bathtubs. It didn't change, right? but there were no standards. 
So if you right. standardize it, one is from a health aspect, you know what's in it. Then we also look at the tax benefits. Um, yeah. Color, I'm, I'm going to say to be funny, but not to be funny. Colorado is making money in marijuana tax benefits that they're giving it away. Right. Yeah. All of the t- they can't they can't use all of those tax increases and in taxes that they've collected to be able. So now they're just going down that list. Previously, it was like, OK, we're going to make sure that we have mental health and we're going to make sure we have this. They're digging deep because education was a big um, beneficiary. They're not going to to like so many of the lower priorities that they had because they are flush with that. And, and everything should be about the money and the taxes. But there is some benefit to that, that you can then take that into our communities and we can better our education. Uh, Because that's another thing that you focused a lot on, has been trying to improve uh, our education system and making sure that the schools as best as we can are fully funded. You know, here's another tax revenue. What what, um, limitations have you had in being able to go as far as you wanted to with the education component as far as being able to fund our schools and provide equity within the schools? Money. <laughs> we need more money. Um, you know, the the I had a bill the past two years that would fully implement and fund the Board of Education's recommended standards of quality. Um, and that was a half a billion dollars a year. And then I had a budget amendment to lift the cap on state the state share of support personnel, which was put in place during the recession. And that's another half a billion dollars a year. And I've done that every year for several years because that's the minimum we need to meet our K-12 education needs right now. But we also need more funding for school renovation, construction, and modernization Um, because you have so many school buildings that are over 50 years old that are just falling apart. We need to pay our support personnel and our teachers more. We need to fully fund pre-K and early childhood education because it, it, the equity gap begins at birth. And, and we have a child care and early childhood education system that is on the brink of collapse right now. And the current funding mechanism is not sustainable. Um, so I didn't, the, I didn't get anywhere near what I wanted. Uh, but I'm going to keep pushing for it. And and what we were able to do with that SOQ bill is get more nurses, social workers, and mental health professionals and have the state pay more of our share for those. Um, And we were able, I have a child care stabilization bill that creates a pilot program to look at spending federal subsidies based on enrollment and not attendance, which is what we do now. And also look at what you need to fully fund quality, which means paying early childhood educators and childcare providers what they are worth. Um, Because right now, the more you pay them, that goes directly to parents and they can't afford to pay it. So we've got to figure out, you know, more of early childhood education and childcare is a public benefit that we have got to pay our fair share up for. And so uh, continuing to focus on that. Um, and then I've got a universal child care plan um, where if I get my way, no family will have to pay more than 7% of their income on child care. I actually was having a conversation with one of the attorneys in my office. So now think about it. We're a county office. She's an attorney, so the expectation is that the numbers should be high enough that somebody can deal with what their uh, average living expenses would be. She's about to have kid number two. The monthly daycare costs are going to run over $3,400 a month. That's not pre-tax. It's $3,400. So when you sit down and you're talking to somebody dollar for dollar, at some point, people are so crushed by those costs that it's going to cost them to go to work. So it's, it's a net negative. Forget about net, you know, some sort of positive that you could say maybe is less than. So, and, and it will always impact women more than always. it impacts anybody else. Always. And, and as a matter of fact, um, most of the job, 90% of the jobs nationally that were lost in December were women leaving the workforce because they, could, they didn't have childcare, they couldn't afford childcare, and the brunt of parenting falls on the mom. Yeah. 
And in and, and that situation, that's, as a society, as a community, we can't afford to leave that much talent on the table, ever. No. Um, no. And so those are the things that, that are really tough. Now we're going to just switch gears a little bit um, and ask a couple of things here as far as um, you've been out in Loudoun County on a number of uh, different occasions. And we really appreciate, the one, that you're recognizing that we are a community, but your investment in our community as well. You've been out here, and, and I know um, back in November, you came out and you, you did the old, uh, uh, it's, it's not the walks of the poles, what am I saying? Uh, souls oh. to the poles. Thank you. Um, why did you choose to do that within our community as far as what is your investment in Loudoun County? that makes you want to take your time to come out here and be so supportive of us? Well, to be fair, I love all of Virginia. So um, <laughs> I, I, I love to go anywhere when I can, but um, you know, part of it is Loudoun is a, it's changed a lot since um, I first started going. Um, I think the first time I really spent a lot of time in Loudoun was maybe around 2000. 12 or 14 when I spoke at a Loudoun Democratic Committee meeting. And then it was sort of um, this mix of mostly white suburbs and booming tech industry with still some kind of sleepy little downtown Leesburg and, um, and, and kind of farmland. And the demographics have changed so rapidly and it's just, I don't know. It's like the people, I have a lot of friends there, obviously, um, you guys and, and Phyllis Randall and, and Pastor Michelle. Um, and, and part of it was just the, I just kept getting invited to come. I, you know, the, Pastor Michelle invited me to come when, when the NAACP was trying to figure out how to commemorate the lynchings that occurred in Loudoun. Um, and as chair of the MLK commission, we had begun our lynching in Virginia project. And so it's just, you know, the more I come, the more I realize that Lowndes is kind of a microcosm of the Commonwealth. It's, it's, it's changing, it's growing. And with that comes some growing pains, but it's a community that very much wants to do right by its people. Um, but that's complicated. And, and trying to reconcile uh, a very painful past with a very hopeful future, which that's what all of Virginia is trying to do. So I don't know, I just, and then part of it is whatever Phyllis Randall and Pastor Michelle asked me to do, I just do. <laughs> that's what makes you even smarter than we thought you were. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you too. Yeah. That's awesome. But I appreciate that because I'll tell you this. Um, and I know we use this phrase in, in common language now, you know, that our kids need to see themselves in our leaders. And that's the, one of the benefits that I see with you coming into our community, because one is our young girls and our young girls of color can say, you know what? This is huge. And it's been it's it's been going on for uh, almost 10 years, as you indicated. And now that we've got a vice president who also can be that role model. Um, I, I think that's very huge for our kids to be able to see. Yeah. How much pressure do you feel having to be that role model, not just for our young girls, but really just about for everybody in Virginia? It comes and goes. Um, I'm all, I guess I'm always conscious that I'm being watched and that I am a role model. Um, and I think I, I, I was sort of, you know, my parents were very clear that I had to work twice as hard, be twice as good, and wouldn't be given the same grace as my white counterparts um, for mistakes. And so I always have that voice in the back of my head. And, I, and my life has shown me that was true. <laughs> My life has shown me that's true. Um, and so I, it does put a little bit of pressure on, I have to prove that I can do it. 
But if I fail, I, it's not just me failing. It is sending a message or, or, or to other people watching. Well, if she can't do it, then what makes me think I can't, especially little girls. Um, so I do feel that weight. I also feel the weight, you know, one of my favorite phrases is, you know, I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. And so I know everything I accomplish gives honor to them. And I'm, I'm trying not to get emotional right now, I might, but um, everything I accomplish is because so many people sacrifice so much for me to have what I have and be who I am. And yet future generations, everything I do is paving a way for them. And I feel that weight. I feel that weight. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't do what I do because I want to be a successful black woman doing it. It's just like, I see problems. I want to solve them. I see pain. I want to ease it, but I do feel that weight. Um, and often I'm the first or the only one in the room and, and, and how well I do determines if another one's coming and that can be lonely. And, um, but my mom went through it. My sisters went through it. My grandparents went through it. So I'll go through it. So my daughter doesn't have to. That's awesome. And, and you're exactly right. In almost in any environment, if we, somebody, and we'll just say it, uh, you know, if we see a, a white male fail or not do well, it's just John Smith. That's, that's the end of the conversation. Whereas if it is a person of color, it's like, oh, we knew that was going to happen. Or how did we not see that coming? It's always that relationship. It's almost like that person is less than whole. Um, but we really need to have individuals like yourself in our leadership because we need to see that. And we need to see the successes. And I will also suggest this to you. Um, it's okay if you trip because we got you. It's okay if you trip because it's how you stand there up thereafter that is going to be really the bigger lesson for all of us to be able to see is in the grace of how you stood back up. Um, I know that's a lot of weight that you that you feel in the position that you have, and it's legitimate weight. I mean, honestly, you you have a great opportunity, but with that opportunity, boy, is it a lot of responsibility. Um, but you know, keep looking forward because what you're doing is creating that path for somebody else. And I know you have a, a daughter and you have a young son as well. And we are hopeful that that's the work that you're putting in right now is going to make it less necessary for them to put that work in so that they can just shine and, and rise as they can on their own and not have to worry about somebody looking at them as, as a little bit differently in that regard or less than. So that's pretty awesome. Thank you for that. And I, and I, I really appreciate you, you speaking to the weight that you feel. And Thank just, you. you know, kind of along those veins, you were such a consummate public servant. And for someone like me who spent so many years trying to encourage more African-Americans to run for office, you were like the perfect example <laughs> of what they should do. So that's great. And you mentioned Sorensen. I'm also a Sorensen grad. You mentioned Andy Block. He was in my class. You know, I would love for, for you to give advice to those people who want to enter public service. What do you recommend? You know, the first step is, is have an honest conversation with yourself about why you're doing it. Um, because if you're doing it to be somebody or to be something, that's a very different path than if you're doing it to do something. Um, and I say that because if the, if, if the status is more important than the work, you're going to blow with the wind mm -hmm. and you're going to be afraid all the time mm -hmm. about whether you can gain or keep the status. Mm -hmm. But if you're focused on the work, then whether you win or lose doesn't matter. Cause at the end of the day, you're like, you know what? I've made somebody's life better. So that's the first piece. The second is you really need to also understand who you are and what you are capable of and what you're not be honest with yourself um, and figure out, are you, I'll put this in restaurant terms. Are you in the front of the house person or the back of the house person? You know, are you 
the principal out there, the face of something, or are you the worker bee behind the scenes getting things done? Very different personalities, very different paths. Um, and then finally, what are you passionate about? And do something you're passionate about. And, 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 and it goes back to why you're doing it because you're going to get frustrated. You are going to get knocked down. You are going to fail at some point. And if you're passionate about it and you know why you're doing it, you go back to that core and you pick yourself back up and say, all right, I am doing this because, and that is worth getting knocked down and picking myself up and moving forward again. Excellent. Excellent. I have um, a question and I know that normally Buda appoints me as the ambassador of youth in this show. So I'm going to, I'm going to jump in before she puts me there and just act on it. Um, one thing that I found just extremely fascinating about your story that I, I didn't know until recently was your involvement with like the young Democrats at, you know, the very beginning. And I think that that is really inspiring for a lot of, you know, young people in politics to see that you're not in a, like any sort of silo when you choose to get involved with like young Democrats, you know, it intermingles with the change that happens in the General Assembly and in campaigns and it, it bridges very naturally. And so I'm curious as to, you know, when you're talking to folks who are young, um, who either don't care about politics or maybe have some reservations, what do you think you know, they should be thinking about or following to sort of see their place in this structure? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, we, you hear all the time, we are a government by and for the people. That, that means the product government produces is only going to be as good as the people who participate and reflect the perspectives of the people who participate. And if you're, if you're not in the room or having your voice heard, then your needs aren't going to be met. And, 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 you know, we, we always hear, you know, young people are the leaders of tomorrow. You're the leaders of today. You know, I remind people, Barbara Johns was 16 years old when she said, you know, I'm not going to take it anymore. And we're going to have a walkout that led to desegregated schools. 16. Um, and the stakes are so much higher now that you can't just sit on the sidelines and let us plan your future for you. Um, you've got to be there. And I think, and it is fun. You know, I have made lifelong friendships and, and learned so much from people I met, you know, canvassing 30 years ago. Um, driving around the Commonwealth in a car with six people <laughs> um, and learning how to organize other people is a skill that helps you no, no matter where you go. Um, and I think, and I know a lot of folks your age have lost faith in the system and got the ability to really do anything. And so if you give up hope, then we are lost. And we'll never fix it. But you can't wait to take your place at the table. You've got to do it now. That's great advice. I know Nick and his question may have just called us OL deep. I'm gonna let that part slide, Nick. <laughs> That's all right. We we <laughs> saw the events of uh, January 6th. And yeah. we are also aware now that there were some individuals from Virginia that went to DC and participated. Being involved in politics, uh, as you have, and just trying to make those changes and work for the people, how did that impact you? I, oh, so, you know, when I told you I found my dad's um, poll, that was January 5th. Mm -hmm. and, and remember, January 5th was when, you know, John Ossoff and, and, and Reverend Warnock were elected to also elected two new African-American women to the General Assembly. Um, so I went to bed hopeful, ready to see the first African-American woman certified as vice president. And instead, I saw people for the first time since 1861 
try to take by force what they couldn't take at the ballot. And I was, and knowing I had friends in that building hmm. who I was very worried about. I was angry, I was devastated, but it renewed my commitment to public service and to democracy. And it, and it reminded me what John Lewis says, democracy is, is an action not a noun. And all of us have to be committed to democracy surviving, which goes back to Nick. <laughs> if you aren't participating, then how are you going to ensure democracy survives? I think that's a challenge to you, Nicholas. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's where we are with that. Um, yes. it, it, it's interesting because I, I remember uh, and I'll tell you this, I was very fearful as to how he was going to go out. In my mind, I thought he was going to start a civil war. In my mind, I thought he was going to start an international war because that was probably one of the, the two, of the two things what he could do um, to try to create enough chaos that it would almost allow him that opportunity to continue in that role, even though he was not elected to continue in that role. Um, so when I saw the events of January 6th, it was interesting because in my mind, I was like, you know what, I'm not, because there was a lot of chatter, so it was not a surprise. Um, I wasn't surprised, but I felt even uh, as OLD as I am, Nick, um, I, I lost some of my innocence because I never thought that we would, you know, we could always protest against the government. We could protest all day long. That's our right. And we will, God willing, forever have that right. But to try to go ahead and, and, and create that insurrection, I... I just, uh, I, in my mind, I never really was prepared for that. So we, you know, they're going to be up and down the streets and they're going to cause, you know, yelling and screaming and just some havoc. I did not ever contemplate that. And even to this day, and I know it's not been a long time, but it has been, you know, almost 50 days. It's still very disheartening to have seen that, to think that that many people who in an otherwise situation are very fortunate of themselves would think that that was the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, so another angle for me from that um, event was when I think back and I reflect on Black Lives Matter and you had how law enforcement responded to it. And somebody made this statement, which I thought was was so on point, which was we're not asking for anybody to have been harmed during January 6th. We're not asking for law enforcement to have shot them. All we're asking for you to look at this is to say this, don't shoot us when we're in the streets and we're walking and we're protesting and we're having that situation. Just treat us with that same uh, expectation and dignity. Yeah. And when we saw the individuals on January 6th and they had weaponry and they had violence and they were attacking, they're harming law enforcement, right? I mean, just as if it, with the audacity of not even showing that they cared or they thought there would be any consequence. Um, so that really, from a criminal justice perspective, was a big takeaway for me as well as to see how people perceived threat differently. And a lot of it was based on the color of the skin. Yeah. You know, so that that uh, was depressing, but it was also um, emboldening in the sense that people were also seeing it because now we had a chance to to see those distinctions and you couldn't say it's in somebody's, you know, uh, cons conspiracy theories, or it's not in somebody's frame of mind. No, it's, we saw it. And I don't care what the color of your skin is. You saw it yeah. almost like what happened with, you know, with uh, George Floyd early on. Uh, and that's another situation where I spoke a little bit about that, but for COVID, I don't think we would be here where we recognize how um, impactful that event was. Yeah. Because yeah. many people, because many people were watching it in real time. So it wasn't like somebody came back to work yesterday and said, oh, I saw the news. We watched it in real time. And I think our kids sitting beside us and probably asking the questions like, mommy, daddy, what is that guy doing? Yeah. Or, we have to be accountable to our kids. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think COVID and the internet did for George Floyd and, and sort of racial injustice what television did for the Vietnam War and for the Civil Rights Movement in the 60s. It did um, now, I'm sorry. 
Yeah, and I was I I, I met a man. Um, you know, I live very near the Robert E. Lee statue here in Richmond, um, which was ground zero for protests here. And I I talked to a a guy who came with his family, and I asked sort of what what made him come, and he's like, you know, I think because like it was almost as if God told us to take a time out, and there was no sports. And there was nothing else to watch. And so you had to watch George Floyd get murdered. And mm-hmm. you had to sit with that and think about it and process it. Um, and had had we had it been sort of life as normal, I don't think it would have been as viral. I, I agree. And and then going back to the General Assembly for Virginia. That was also an impetus for a lot of changes in our state laws. Yes. Uh, and that goes into our, you know, the search warrants. It goes into some accountability for law enforcement, you know, yeah. also within the, the community oversight committees. So those are three that just come to, to, to my mind. And you're welcome to comment on any of them or any others that, that you participated in and you saw because that has and we'll continue to help our community. What was your impression of that as it was going on as to whether or not the George Floyd incident, and actually shouldn't, it's not just him. I mean, because I, I don't think we have enough time in, in, in the world for us to be able to list every name of every uh, black person that was killed unnecessarily and unwarranted and just from merely from, from, from the bias and the racism that they experienced for us to be able to acknowledge them um, properly. But those events... I think impacted and informed a lot of the decisions that the general assembly did in this special session last year. Yeah. Uh, two things happened. It was, it was as if for, for people who didn't, and I'd say for a majority of Americans who either couldn't or wouldn't acknowledge or see the racial injustice that had been happening all along, they, they saw it. They saw it for the first time. And it forced them to question their beliefs and, and wh- how they thought the world was. Um, and then there was a collective shout of enough. And, and we saw in the General Assembly that collective shout saying, and now we expect you to do something about it. Um, And at the same time, we haven't talked about the monuments yet, but, you know, again, I, I live two streets away from Monument Avenue and some of my neighbors who, who, who drove, drove past, drove past those monuments every day and never thought about it or, or didn't understand, like, what is, what is the big deal now are saying, oh, I get it now. They got to come down. That would not have happened, but for George Floyd and the protests. I know you mentioned that you've been in uh, Leesburg uh, several times. And I'll, I'll tell you this, when I graduated from law school back in 93, <clears throat> um, a colleague of mine and I decided to open our practice in Leesburg. My office has never been more than two blocks away from the courthouse. So the historic district has always been my place. And I remember a, maybe about six to nine months after we opened up the practice, one of my other law school colleagues who then opened his practice in Michigan said, hey, I heard you opened your practice in Leesburg. I was like, yeah. He goes, that's a cool place. Do they still have the Confederate soldier out front? I was like, the what? He had the Confederate soldier. I'm like, uh, yeah, that's the statue with the soldier guy with the gun kind of his back. So she, he goes, yeah. He says, uh, is that still there? I said, yeah, it is there. I was in New York City. I didn't know what a Confederate soldier was. I didn't know what the impetus or the 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 message behind that was on any level because I just saw it as a Virginia soldier. I don't know what the heck that means. You know, when you're in, in New York, you don't go south of New Jersey. I mean, you just don't do that. So this was really hard. I was like, wow, is that what it means? And because of George Floyd, we actually were able to have that removed last year. And it we we and you were mentioning uh, Chair Randall. Chair Randall has been a big proponent of, of having that soldier statute removed for many, many years. And that was one of her highlights as far as <clears throat> wanting to run on that, saying that the time's going to come that it's going to come down. 
And after George Floyd, it came down. But the best thing about it is it came down. Well, two things. It's a good and bad. One of the good things that it was is it came down and it was without incident. And that's the best way to do it because the community spoke about that. Yeah. The fact that it was taken down in the middle of the night, I thought was a bit of a lost opportunity for those individuals who were impacted over the decades that it was up there, for them to have been able to participate and see it. So that was a loss to me, but overall, I was just pleased that they've removed it. Um, So here, yeah, here, um, you know, and again, I drive past that Lee statue every single day and I never realized how much mental and emotional energy I spent ignoring it Mm -hmm. until I heard the governor say it's time for it to come back. Um, And it was like a weight was lifted that I never even knew was there. And, you know, and if if you've been here to Monument Avenue, that's not the only, it was the first one built. And oh, by the way, it was built at the end of reconstruction as part of, you know, it was the same time that the, that the it was in response to the growth of political, social, and economic power of Black people during Reconstruction. When the white power structure came back, they changed the Constitution to disenfranchise Black people. They began racial terror lynchings, and they began the lost cause white supremacy narrative that these monuments embody to tell Black people, stay in your place. And to begin to divide a growing coalition between Blacks and poor whites. That was intentional. Mm -hmm. And and I remember, um, but you got all along Monument Avenue, you got these statues. The first one that came down was Stonewall Jackson. I will never forget that day. It was raining. There was a crowd of people all watching you know, the, the crane and everything, get ready. Um, I am going to get emotional again. Um, when that statue lifted up off that pedestal and the skies opened up, there was a clap of thunder. The bells from the church rang. And I felt like my ancestors were weeping with joy. And that moment, just watching that statue lift up was as, again, that weight that I never knew was there coming off my shoulders. It was powerful. Wow. It is powerful. I mean, it, it, the way you described it, God's, God was speaking. Yeah, you because know, those, mm-hmm. those are all of the elements. I mean, God was speaking. The time was right. Time is coming, and, yes. And, and I like the way you, you you mentioned the fact that it was a weight you didn't even know you were bearing. That's that's how like common it was, and that's how weighted it was that until it was released, you didn't even realize that that you'd been dealing with that. And when we start talking about things like that, is to to really try to peel back the layers to say how are we impacting members of our community when it's it's something that they don't even speak on because they may not realize the impact. But it is, it's, it's, it's PTSD on a yeah. constant, 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 you know, level that, that we've got to start being mindful about that is how do we treat each other and why we're doing it? You yeah. spoke to the issue as far as the intentional divide between blacks and um, uh, poor whites. Think about it because the message is somebody's coming to take away from you something yeah. that you have. Yeah. Yeah. And it so was, you, it, and you're, it was, it was this sense of, well, your life is hard, but at least you're white. Yeah. No, it is. Because it also takes your eye off of the person who's actually causing you uh, yes. that harm where you're not able to maintain a job or you can't get certain uh, opportunities. But if I'm not focusing on the wrongdoer and I'm looking at this person, yes. divide and conquer all day long. Yes. Now, yes. now we, we saw that with the last uh, administration with immigration, where they became the new hated group. Yes. Uh, Virginia also this past year uh, passed the law which allows now our not our undocumented immigrants to be able to have the lawful ability to be able to transport themselves using vehicles through driving. Yes. Why was that important to the General Assembly? Well, I mean, just 
so hugely important because if you can't drive, you can't work. Um, and certain, certain, you know, you can't take your children to school. You can't um, go to the doctor because we've created this, this system where it's based on you driving. <laughs> I mean, we haven't invested in public transportation. We haven't invested in walking and, you know, walking trails or bike trails or anything. It's like everybody who has a car, the world revolves around you. And so if we take that privilege, like if we take that away from you, you can't thrive. So it was, it was very important that we give them the ability to drive. And from the criminal justice system, that was huge for us as well because of a, a number of reasons. You already nailed the fact that if you can't drive, you can't support your family. And what you end up doing is you created this culture of criminalization without yes. thinking about, okay, who are you hurting? Obviously, yes. you're hurting the person who is choosing to drive without a license, but now you're hurting the spouse in the home. You're hurting the kids in the home. You're hurting yes. that community that is never going to be able to raise themselves up because guess what? They can't maintain those jobs that would be able to give them the opportunity to do better and raise themselves out of it. So we Which were intentionally creating that, that depression. Which is exactly why the law that you lose your license if you can't pay court fines and fees made absolutely no sense. Because <laughs> how are you going to pay them if you can't work? And, yeah. and we finally got rid of that last year in, in, in the 2020 session, too. Oh, that, and that was huge as well. You're exactly right. Because at that point in time, you're, again, criminalizing certain things. But I don't give you a way to be successful. All I'm doing is waiting for you to get caught in that trap. And then you're yep. back in the system. Right. So it's yes. always that numbers game. And on the note of being successful, let's talk a couple of, about a couple of things. I'm sorry. And I know you, I, I want to be mindful about your time. Can we steal another three or four minutes? Oh, absolutely. I'm having a great time. Awesome. That's going to be another 40 minutes, Nick. We're good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what we want to do is now talk about the, the hope for the success of our communities in the future from a legislative perspective. What is on the horizon for Virginia? Mm. So, you know, we've, we've made so much progress, but we have to protect and build on it. Um, and, and, in, and just in less than two years, there's so many firsts. You know, Virginia is now the first state in the South to have its own Voting Rights Act, to extend worker protections to domestic workers, um, the, to proactively protect access to reproductive health to have a hundred percent clean energy standard. We've got to protect all that and make sure it's implemented in the way that we intend. Um, I think though, as we recover from COVID, we, we have got to understand we're not going to recover back to exactly where we were last March when everything shut down. We can't, it's impossible. We, everything has changed dramatically. We have inequity, that was already there, that's now been made worse, that now everybody sees. Um, we have systems, you know, there were trends that were coming in just the, whether it was in our education system, criminal justice, technology, climate, you know, things that we had maybe three to five to 10 years to plan for that now are here. So we've got to manage that transition. Um, and we've got to rebuild our economy, our healthcare, our economic safety nets, our education system, um, uh, in all in a way that addresses that inequity, that manages that transition. And then going back to what, what we were talking about with Nick, that restores faith that a lot of people have lost in government's ability to understand and solve their problems. And we have to do it in a way that centers people and the people that are hurting, um, like, the people who are closest to the pain have to be close to the solution. So that's our challenge. You pick the issue. That's our challenge. Um, when we, when we come out of, of COVID, which I, you know, we're, we're, we still have a long way to go, but I feel like with you know, the more vaccines, you know, the numbers are going in the right direction. Um, we're, you know, recovery's on the horizon. So we got to manage through, and and then just rebuild, you know, steal Joe Biden's phrase, like rebuild better and not just go back to where we were in March of, of 2020. That's awesome. 
I want to open the floor if, if Nick or Krista have any other questions or also for you, Jennifer, if you have any questions for us, because I know we hogged up the conversation where we peppered you uh, with questions. I felt like I was in the courtroom and you were on a stand. We just wanted to shoot you with some questions and figure out what the heck. Um, no, you're, you're, you're a pretty good Oprah. <laughs> well, I thank you very much for your time. And uh, we really do appreciate the fact that you came in and you shared with us what the General Assembly and you yourself specifically have done for these last couple of years, as well as uh, over the, the decade plus. Um, but we welcome you back at any point in time. And if you ever have any needs or anything that we can do to assist or help you in any way, we are here for you. And uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you. Same here. And I look forward to seeing you guys in person very soon. Excellent. Thank you.